Okay, thank you very much, uh, host, and I'd love to thank the organizers for having me over to this uh, interesting meeting. This is not my usual community, so I'm really enjoying the content so far, and I hope to meet many of you in person during the meeting. Uh, right, so my name is Milita Todorovic and I work at the Department of Mechanical Materials Engineering at the University of Turku in Finland. And um, many of you know me uh, from Aalto University where I spent a lot of years working with Patrick Rinke. And so a few years ago I moved to Turku and started my own group. And uh, we very much continue um, doing active learning and uh, doing functional materials. So today I will tell you a little bit about this. So at my department, at materials engineering, everybody is all about functional materials and materials for devices. So we have to engineer different kinds of materials and different kinds of devices, and our task is to optimize their performance. So a lot of these materials are, are very complex. For example, with optoelectronics, we have a lot of uh, optically active small molecules deposited on complex substrate, phase change memory, um, uh, amorphous alloys, complex biofuel molecules, or even these organic and inorganic solar cells where you have small molecules embedded inside a perovskite lattice. Um, so there's something really common about all of, these all of these systems and that is that they have widely varying chemistries and uh, they often contain some organic and inorganic components, and that is on purpose so that you can exploit this for some kind of functionality. But this also makes it very difficult to study these materials. Um, we can't really use simple potentials, so often we have to do full quantum mechanical simulations to understand the structure of these materials and their electronic properties, and therefore understand how to tune the structure and properties. Um, so, I think we all agree that the objectives of material science is to refine these materials and optimize their properties for some kind of technological applications. So, uh, when Patrick and I learned about machine learning in 2015, we were very quick to start on this because, as we now know, this has turned out to be a gen gen uh, general accelerator in our field. So, uh, we of course develop a lot of methodology, but ultimately what we'd like to do with these methods is accelerate discovery. And so nowadays we're applying machine learning to material science data to once again refine those materials and their performance in devices. And um, briefly, as you all know, we can use AI and machine learning in many different ways. We can do data analytics to look for structure in our data. We can uh, train complex models um, that we'll then use as fast predictors for pre-screening. So once you have a trained model, you can input many possible candidate materials and quickly get an estimate of the functional properties so you can figure out which molecules or which materials are, are interesting for your purpose. Then we're very fond of these kind of uh, surrogate models. We used to call them the structure property models, but these days, of course, it's extended because it's processing to structure, which changes the property of material, which changes the way they function in devices. Um, and with these models, we can, uh, we can efficiently do materials design and it, we can optimize the devices and materials. And increasingly, we're using AI to also help our experimental colleagues and guide their data collection. So nowadays, uh, I run the materials informatics laboratory and in our group, we develop materials for these three different areas. Um, in energy, we're mostly working on renewable energy applications, so um, organic solar cells or perovskite solar cells, lots of rational sensor development. We're doing atmospheric chemistry, studying the surface, st surface structures of, uh, of aerosols, and we've done a lot of spectra work and, and work with images. Um, on the health, again, biosensors and drug delivery systems are very important, and these are all, again, organic and organic uh, systems. And now we're increasingly involved in manufacturing, sustainable metallurgy, and uh, helping our colleagues optimize their materials and processes. Um, since this is an AI conference, I can finally show some of the methods that we're using to do this kind of work. So on the energy side, we tend to have large data, so we can, we can use for large data methods and a lot of simulations, of course, and the same on the health side, but then on the manufacturing side, we have typically small data, and there we cannot use so many of our simulation methods. Um, in any case, uh, over the years, we've come up with some wish list of what we would like our methods to do, um, so we would like our AI to help us with forward and inverse structure property predictions. So not only would we like to get uh, properties simply given structure, but also of course we would like to uh, get some structures given desirable properties. Uh, it's really important that, to us that these models be interpretable and trustworthy. And we've already heard from Anika today about interpretable methods. Um, but also this trustworthy, we would like to know where the methods are doing well and also where the methods are not doing well. Right? This would actually make us trust somehow the method more. Um, uncertainty is another big thing that we like. Um, there's lots of uncertainties 
uh, in experimental work, but also in simulations um, that uh, are related to the inherent approximations that we all use in quantum mechanical methods. So this is important to us. And uh, well, we work with small data as much as big data, so this, this has to be good. And increasingly, we would like, we are starting to get information from different sources, and we would like to be able to combine this in, in one model. And this is why we particularly like active learning or autonomous optimization, and this is why this is the topic of my talk, even though we work also with many other different methods. So, um, I want to introduce you briefly to active learning with Bayesian optimization. I'd like to remind you what this is before showing some examples. Um, so, we've learned a lot from our computer science colleagues. They've been, since the 90s, using this, this technique a lot for autonomous optimization. Um, basically, autonomous means taking the human out of the loop so the machine comes to, to the solution itself by iterating itself and making decisions. Uh, Bayesian optimization is often used for global optimization of unknown black box functions. Um, by black box function, I mean something that where we don't know the functional form, but we can evaluate it anywhere. Um, and it does this global optimization by making the most probable statistically likely surrogate model of these black box functions. And then from that surrogate model, it just reaches out the optima. Um, and it does so by strategic sampling in the following way. So you have to start with some data, but this doesn't have to be big data. This can be very small data. And then there's two steps. Step number one is to do Bayesian regression, which is fitting, the uh, fitting this data with a distribution of the functions in a Bayesian way. And I will explain in a second how that works. And then after this step is done, we can use the outcome to build an acquisition function. And this tells us where in the search space uh, we should get the next data point for maximum information back into the model. And this is then what we do. We evaluate this, we put it back into the data, and then this two-step process is repeated over and over again until convergence. So now I want to talk a little bit more about these two steps so that you understand the details. Um, Bayesian regression can be done with many um, other kernels, but this, this is often done with Gaussian processes. Um, and this is a type of supervised learning, a kernel-based supervised learning, as we've heard this morning from Ignatia. Um, so, um, Gaussian process has two forms, a prior and a posterior. So, a prior of a Gaussian process is just a collection of many possible functions, any one of which could be our solution before we see any data. So we always have to start with a prior. And then as soon as we collect some data points, for example, these two here, we apply the Bayes theorem, the Bayes rule, onto this Gaussian process prior. And that mathematical step um, collapses the space of all these possible solutions to only those that pass through these data points. So it's like collapsing a wave function. Um, so now you can see that there are still many possible solutions to this function, but all of them have to pass through these data points. It's a constraint, right? Um, what we can do is we can compute the statistical average of all these possible solutions, and that's the full line. We call that the posterior mean, and that's what we say is the statistically most likely function given only these two data points and the prior. And then the space of all these possible solutions, uh, marked in gray, is called the posterior variance. And the variance is a measure of the model's confidence in its own fit. So the model is very confident here next to these data points because it knows that the functions are correct in this region. But where we have no data, there are many possible solutions and the model is not very confident. And this is why the posterior variance is very large. So the outcome of a Gaussian process regression is posterior mean and posterior variance. And this is what I mean that Bayesian, Bayesian regression is a regression with many functions, not just one function, but many functions. And what you work with is just the average and then the, the, the range spanned by all these possible solutions. So uh, this is a kernel method, as you know, and um, a choice of kernel is something that is a parameter here. Um, every point in X is a normal distribution described by a mean and a covariance function between X and X prime, and this is where the kernel comes in. So this is a very common RBF kernel or radial basis uh, function kernel, it's just a Gaussian one. And this one has two hyperparameters. It has the uh, exponent, which is called the signal variance, and the, um, the length scale, signal length scale, which uh, acts as sigma in the exponent uh, denominator. Um, and uh, these two are something that normally in uh, other machine learning methods we'd have to set, but in Gaussian process regression, this is fitted at the same time as the data is fitted. These parameters are uh, computed by optimizing the marginal likelihood by the GPR libraries itself. So as we keep adding data and as we converge the model, these hyperparameters converge on their own and we don't have to set them. 
Okay, uh, now let's say we've done the fitting and we've got our posterior mean and variance. Um, let's move on to our acquisition function and that tells us where to get the next data point for maximum benefit. So the first question we asked ourselves is what is maximum benefit? Sometimes you want to get the global solution, optimal solution, as fast as possible with as few evaluations, but sometimes you want to learn the whole surrogate model everywhere in your search space. Um, so there are multiple acquisition functions in the circulation. This is known technology. We like this exploratory lower confidence bound which has the following form. Um, it is plus posterior mean, which we just computed, minus a factor multiplying the square root of uh, posterior variance. Um, and normally we would evaluate this function, search for where it takes the minimum, and that's the location where we should uh, sample for maximum benefit. Now, uh, it is no, uh, no accident that there are these two terms. If we look at them separately, they do slightly different things. So if you forget about the second part and only look at the posterior mean, uh, where that takes a minimum is the, uh, the current location of the global minimum, right? So if we're looking for the global minimum, um, the system would like to sample near the current optimal solution to see if an even better solution can be found. And this is called data exploitation. On the other hand, if we look at the minus posterior variance, um, um, this would take a minimum where the variance is large, and this is where we typically have no data. So then this term is responsible for uh, driving the acquisition in areas where we have no data or have not been visited before, and this is the exploration term. So if we then take these two together, um, there's a bit of exploration and exploitation, and balancing these two together is, is a very um, efficient way, a data efficient way of reaching the, the optimal solution. So I want to show a 1D example of how this works so that you can visualize it. So here we have computed, this is actually in kilocalories per mole, an energy over the hydral angle being rotated 360 degrees. So the blue line is the actual solution and there's a global minimum and a local minimum here. So as I said, you don't have to start with many data points. So we start with three data points right here and the, blue, the, the black line is the current statistically most likely model. It's not very good. It thinks the global minimum is here where the green uh, line is and the uh, dashed uncertainty is literally off the chart. So as we go from three points to six points, the um, system will try to sample to the left and the right of the current global minimum in an exploitation move to try to find a better solution. And so it takes this point and this point and now accidentally it just happens to find the global minimum already. So now uh, the shape of the model is much improved in this region, but it's still not very good here. There was a point that was taken here to reduce the uncertainty, so this was an exploration step, but it didn't manage to fully uh, reduce the uncertainty. So as we go from six points to nine points, the model will try to sample again to the left and the right of the global minimum, but it won't find a better solution, so now it knows it doesn't have to come back to this zone. And also, it takes another point here um, where the uncertainty is still high, and now it locates this local minimum. And now you can see with nine points, the shape of the 1D function is almost fully approximated, and we can continue adding points, but it will no longer change. So we will know now that the solution has converged. And this is the nice thing about um, active learning methods. You can stop taking data when your solution no longer changes. So you don't have to work with very large data sets. You can only take the data that you really need to, to solve your problem. So now I hope you understand a little bit more about how this process works. What I've explained in 1D is exactly how it works in 2D, in 3D, in 4D, in many more dimensions. Um, and then as a result, uh, when these um, surrogate models converge, we get a converged model for some kind of materials property. We often do structure search and then this property is the potential energy surface from which we can then uh, read out the global and local minima and also uh, data mine the barriers between different minima. Uh, but in principle, this doesn't have to be energy, this could be any property. So this we encoded in, in the software for Bayesian optimization structure search. We called it structure search, but nowadays we, we do everything with it. Um, so the main active learning engine is the Bayesian optimization, and uh, uh, we run this a lot with total energy simulations, which could be a, any total energy from uh, force fields to tight binding to quantum chemistry. Um, and because we often work with very large scale simulations and complex systems, we're interested in configurational packing and this is why we've also frequently used this building block approximation. And we use this tool in two different ways. Um, sometimes we use it for global phase space exploration, just to understand all the possible solutions. And sometimes we use it as fast inference method for, for minima or maxima in black box functions. So now this code has matured a lot. We've built it on top of GPy, but we are having a, a PyTorch uh, implementation in the works. 
Um, we have both API and command line interface, but now we're working on a web interface for our experimental colleagues. We've built in a lot of kernels and acquisition functions, and most importantly, we put priors on the hyperparameters because this makes much, much more robust fitting for, for non-experts. We've put in a lot of batch acquisition functions, uh, gradients for Bayesian optimization, and we've got loads of post-processing routines because it's really important that you analyze this process as it goes to make sure that you're doing this correctly. So now I wanted to show a little bit of uh, different kinds of applications we have made so far. Some on small conformers, a lot in molecular algebra, thin films, even solid-solid interfaces, and most recently on experimental outcomes. So this is one of the first things that we did. Um, we're very interested in these um, organic and organic interfaces. And the key problem to solve is how a small molecule adsorbs on a surface. And this is a function a bit of where it is on the surface, but also how is it oriented towards the surface. And so we compute uh, a surrogate models for adsorption energy, not total energy, as a function of the position and orientation of these molecules. And this is all done autonomously now on, on its own. So BOSS software runs uh, DFT calculations. Uh, and it samples different orientations of the C60 and titanium dioxide anatase, and it builds surrogate models from which we're extracting the global minimum as it goes. And then we're tracking how stable is this global minimum prediction as we sample more and more. And in the beginning, the, this, this uh, orientation starts to shift a little bit, but after a while it stops changing, and then you know you have found the global minimum for adsorption. Um, so what we get from there is a six-dimensional landscape that we can cut in any two dimensions to observe it, right? So we cut it in X and Y and we overlay it with the titanium dioxide surface and we could find that the minimum of energy occurs next to this uh, five-fold coordinated titanium site, which is the reactive part of this anatase surface. And this is what I mean by interpretable models. So we should be able to extract some physical or chemical meaning from these simulations. Um, we have worked on many of these kinds of systems. Here's an example for camphor on copper 111. This is a bulky molecule that presents a lot of challenges for uh, non-contact AFM imaging. So our experimental collaborators deposited camphor deliberately at low temperatures that was still high enough to produce different types of attributes, but when they imaged it, they couldn't uh, detect exactly what kind of uh, configuration this adsorbed in. And so we put uh, camphor onto copper 111, and we again did uh, adsorption surface surrogate models as a function of the molecular orientation and position. And uh, here is again how that worked. So on one side, a boss is just automatically sampling different configurations, building the surrogate model. We're extracting the global minimum, and from the top down, we're checking how much is the global minimum changing. And the uh, copper 111 is six-fold symmetric. So after a while, you see that um, the, um, the registry has, has converged, but then this, this global minimum just shifts, like jumps every 60 degrees. Now here already, we were not just interested in the global minimum. We wanted to find all the possible adsorption solutions so we could compare it to experiments. So we ran this for a little bit longer. It typically takes about 1,000 1, or a few more data points to fully converge all the local minima not just a global minimum. So here are all the local minima that we extracted. So uh, here are the most weakly bound, here are the most strongly bound. And um, these minima, of course, we then relaxed fully and uh, with higher levels of theory to make sure that the energetics were correct. Uh, so these are the results that you see. And immediately we found two groups. In these five configurations that were most strongly bound, oxygen is pointing towards the metal. And in these top three, um, we found the oxygen pointing up towards vacuum. And indeed, when we checked the electronic structure, we found that this was um, onset of chemical bonding, of covalent bonding here. So this is chemisorption via this oxygen. And this is fully physisorbed with no charge transfer between uh, the molecule and the substrate. And this is most likely re responsible for these rotating images in the AFM. Um, then we did some laborious image matching for all of our five pot potential candidate structures. We generated simulated AFM Im images in a stack as you withdraw the tip above the molecule, and then we compared to experimental image stacks of the similar kind, and this is what we found. We found that there were three simulated structures where the simulated AFM somehow matched the experiment. It's disappointing that they're all so blobby and really difficult to interpret. Uh, so our AFM colleagues uh, helped us analyze and find these sharper features. Uh, and we analyzed their length and orientation to find a good match. 
But in any case, it was really useful for them that now they can identify the molecular uh, orientations um, underneath, so they could try to develop these imaging methods more. Um, I have to uh, mention one nice example we did with Oliver Hoffman in Graz uh, about thin films. So Oliver's group has developed a sample group for studying the morphology of thin films that form on surfaces. Um, and this works on principles of identifying uh, possible adsorption sites and then uh, trying out different molecular, molecular adsorption configurations and then building combinatorially the films and finding the lowest energy ones. And they found that TCNE on copper 111 likes to adsorb standing up. Um, but then uh, the question was, how does the second monolayer form? Where does the next molecule adsorb? Because now all the adsorption sites are saturated. And it's not easy to find where is the next adsorption site. But in, uh, in BOSS, we don't need the adsorption site, so we could just put in this monolayer structure as our substrate. And then we put in uh, some vertical and horizontally uh, adsorption molecules into this, and we computed the adsorption energy landscapes to find out that these were the places where the molecule would like to adsorb. And now we know, after full relaxations, that this is how the second layer starts to grow. And this enabled us to look at the charge transfer between the organic and inorganic uh, surface. Um, one simple uh, approach that is working very well as well is just a registry search between two inorganic components where you look at the coating and some substrate. In this case, we were looking for coatings for perovskite solar cells. You get a very simple 2D uh, landscape with very few data points, and you find where the minimum of energy is, and you, you place the coating in that location, and then you relax fully the interface here. And that's after we get the structure, we computed the energy levels on this side and this side and tried to find out how the charge injection across these two layers work. So this is really accelerating the structure search, even though it's not very sophisticated, so we can study those functional properties we're interested in. And by the way, for different coatings and different substrates, you get really different kinds of energy landscapes, so this is not necessarily such a simple problem. Um, conformers, small molecules, are another obvious problem we need to solve. Um, we picked alanine early on as an example because it has many known minima that have been very well documented. And we noticed that a lot of molecules have functional groups which maintain uh, their form and they are rigid during, um, for different conformers. And so if we fix these as building blocks, we could just search for conformers in the, in the search space of torsional angles between these different, different molecules. And here it is again, uh, BOSS is just sampling without human involvement. It's it, this time learning a total energy, and this is the predicted global minimum structure as we sample more and more. So this is the energy of this, this structure. And in the beginning, it's quite poor, but as we add more and more data points, into the model, this estimate is revised and this structure is revised until it reaches this level at 90, 90 sampled points where it no longer changes. So this was done in four dimensions. And then this works exactly the same in higher dimensions. This was actually done with amber, so you have to be a little bit careful. Your quality of your global minimum is just as good as the quality of the energies you're putting in. But um, after we solved this problem, we knew we could go to more complicated systems, which is this which is what our functional materials that our colleagues are interested in for drug delivery. Um, so here we have the cysteine molecule, which has five degrees of freedom, but it's very similar to what I've shown before. And here we really went up to high levels of theory to understand how, how different uh, quantum chemistry methods uh, get the ordering of different conformers differently. This is a known problem. Um, and this is what we found. This was, this was one of the most accurate results that we found. So all of these, uh, these 15 structures that we found, these are the lowest energy, these are the highest energy. So here, in, uh, here are the six structures that we found in experiments. Here are other structures that we found in theory with genetic algorithms. And I have to say, genetic algorithms are incredibly powerful, but it took about 10,000 sampling points to get here. And this took about like maybe 1,200 DFT simulations. And I'm not sure about these new structures, maybe, maybe they're not so relevant. But we did check this with many other cases so that we, we are sure that, that uh, this works correctly. So in all of these cases, after a full structure search and extracting all the local minima, we found the experimentally measured conformers in our lowest X conformers. And this is what we were really looking for. And these kinds of convergences are obtained with about 1,000 DFT uh, static calculations. 
So cysteine in itself is not interesting, but, but this is now interesting because now they put cysteine on this cluster and now they're doing also structure search on the cluster, which has to be constrained to, to prevent steric clashes and they're finding other minima um, and, and now they're moving on with this kind of study. And this is really important because the way that these molecules are oriented really determines the chemical functionality of these, these uh, particles in the biological environment. I will go briefly through some uh, experimental work that we've done with Bayesian optimization. The idea is to guide experimental data collection by developing these predictive models in multiple dimensions of some kind of desired property and then try to optimize that property while doing as few experiments as possible. So this is very important to our colleagues. And here we simply treat the experiment as the black box function that we want to optimize. So we have certain inputs that are adjustable parameters, uh, maybe materials compositions or external, external parameters or processing parameters. And we have some outputs that are, that are measured, maybe materials property um, or structure, and we would like to optimize these outputs as a function of inputs. So here's an example we did with chemical engineers in our uh, university. So we were extracting lignin from wood through this hydrothermal reaction, which depends on temperature and p-factor. And depending on these two factors, you get different types of lignin with different functional groups that can be then used for different products. And we wanted to find out how to target specific lignin chemistries. So here we literally put these experiments into Bayesian optimization. Uh, we checked and they could do four experiments per week. So they gave us four experiments, we built the model, then that told us which next four experiments to perform. We told them this, they did it in another week, they gave us this result, we updated the model, and we did this until convergence. And here is how this worked. So here is a, a surrogate model for the yield of lignin, which of course we want to maximize from the processing as a function of temperature and p-factor. So we started with four ex five experiments. This was not a very good surrogate model. So after the first next four we did with active learning, we had nine points here, and already we have a high yield and a low yield area. And then when we added the second batch, um, this, this same division persisted, but the high yield area started to move from here to a little bit higher and we knew that we still didn't converge yet the model. And then after the third batch, the highest yield moved into this top right corner. And then this stayed the same in the fourth batch, and then we knew we didn't have to do any more data. It was fully converged. So while we were maximizing yield, we were also checking for different kinds of lignin chemistries. Um, so there are these um, yield uh, surrogate models, beta O4 content surrogate models, uh, SG ratio different functional group, hydrocarbons, and now the question was, how do we satisfy multiple objectives simultaneously? So we, we did then multi-objective optimization to try to find maximum yield, but also maximum beta O4 content. And, and this is good for aromatic chemical lignins or maximum yield and low beta O4 content. This is for the antioxidants and so on and so forth. So nowadays, um, this is all working and we've now confirmed in many ways that this is working. So where are we now? Uh, we are implementing more features from computer science into these models to try to accelerate the acceleration, <laughs> to boost it even more. So for example, we can integrate symmetry of the system in many different ways, uh, often also with symmetry augmented kernels, so that you can sample once and add 10 data points, or you know, this, this really massive acceleration. Uh, another great thing is to implement the gradients of energy uh, or any property into the surrogate model. These come out almost for free from our calculation. And if you fit not only with energy data points, but with energy and gradient data points, you get much better models with fewer data points. And then, of course, sometimes we have steric clashes, so we have cost functions now implemented to indicate forbidden zones. But here's the real kicker. In the last couple of years, we've been working a lot with multitask Bayesian optimization. And this allows us to integrate data from different fidelity levels or different sources of information into the same model in a dynamic fashion. So for example, like this. And now we're using the same technology to integrate the human back into the loop to help us focus our search in some meaningful way. But here we're working with computer scientists to find meaningful ways of eliciting knowledge and encoding it into models so that we can, we can ex expedite our, um, our work further with human machine workflows. 
I want to say a few words before I finish with this multiple fidelity modeling. This is very exciting for us. We're doing this with multitask Gaussian process models, uh, which, um, where, we, where we do this linear model of co-regionalization, co 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 um, which assumes a linear relationship between tasks. And this is almost always true in chemistry and physics because our lower fidelity models are, are fitted against higher fidelity stuff. Um, and so what we've done is this multi-stacked models where we sample from force fields, DFT with the reasonable functionals, uh, this is GGA, DFT with hybrids, and then Gaussian quantum chemistry calculations, very heavy duty stuff. And we've done this on the Alanine example and we have found massive acceleration. And this is because I wanna show you how similar the potential energy landscapes are. This is for a force field and this is for a CCSDT um, potential energy surface for the same problem. And you can see there's a high degree of similarity, but the minima are in different places, which is a known problem. But nevertheless, it's really useful for us to, that we can dynamically sample from all these different fidelity levels. So this is not like transfer learning, you put all your low fidelity in the beginning, but you actually sample whenever you need high or low fidelity. So I want to finish and say that um, we've gotten a lot of mileage out of these surrogate models for materials properties. Um, this is all supplied by active learning because then you can stop acquiring data when you need to. And even with expensive calculations, you get very compact data sets. Um, from these surrogate models, you can just read off the optimal solutions. Um, we are now applying it to many different problems. So it depends on simply how you define degrees of freedom. And now we are, uh, this, this uh, technology permits multitask data. So we're now taking this a bit further. Um, brief plug uh, for our DEEM and cost action, which we just started this year. This is a, a cost action for data-driven applications for engineering of functional materials. Um, here are some information on the work groups, and I'm happy to say at least two uh, country representatives are already sitting in the audience, so please join if you find this of interest. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for the attention and for, for all the funding, funding bodies supplying the cash. Thank you, Militra, for a very interesting presentation. We have time for one or two questions. Yeah, you can find me in the coffee break. <laughs> yes, so we Thank it's you. a post session. Thank you for the very interesting talk. I have a question um, about the, the, the Gaussian process. Uh, you, you were saying that you use the known uh, isotropic kernel does it mean that the length scale is different for each Correct. feature? Correct, yes. Did you find any difficult uh, optimizing the length scale, the hyperparameters? Yes, we did. It depended a lot on the initial positions, which is why we now put priors on the hyperparameters, and that made it much better. And which optimizer do you use? Optimizers, mm. LBFGS. When you, when you optimize the... Yeah, yeah, the yeah. but now the, the starting positions are much more reasonable, so it always finds a reasonable solution. Okay. Before, for different kinds of problems entirely, like uh, the same starting point wouldn't work, so you had to like really search, and we got sick of that, and then the priors worked much better. But we can talk but about you it But you still do uh, likelihood... Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, thanks. Marginal likelihood optimization. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk. So I was thinking, could you comment a bit? Shell. Exactly. So I was thinking, can you comment a bit more on how you do the multi-objective optimization, so how yes. you kind of rank the different hierarchies? Yeah, and yeah. then also if there's time uh, about how you actually do in practice this human in the loop. Yeah. Uh, so we do, we do Pareto front analysis, of course. We, we obtain all those models simultaneously and then we discretize them, and then we look uh, at every point in the model, uh, what is the optimal trade-off? And then we have to find the Pareto front where uh, nothing is going down. Um, and then we, do, we can do Pareto fronts in 2D, 3D, 4D, but to be honest, we don't like to do Pareto fronts in multiple dimensions because it's hard to understand and visualize, and we like it intuitive. So uh, yeah, we've, we've, we've done now like a lot of like a, bioplastics engineering, mechanical properties, all kinds of stuff with Pareto fronts. And we like it so much, we're trying to develop uh, Pareto front acquisition functions that specifically target the Pareto front. Uh, that's like for experimental mm. colleagues really nice. So, so is that related to maximizing the hyper volume or something similar? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know actually which, which direction we're gonna take there. So maybe we can talk about that later. Mm. 
Thanks. something very new. We have a final question here from uh, Alexander. Just to follow up on that yes. question before, can you use second order methods? If you, if you take second derivatives, you know, can you accelerate the finding the yeah, yeah. conformers or other searches? So we didn't go in this direction because while first order uh, information is augmenting the model a lot, it blows up the matrix size because you have to take the derivative with respect to every single variable and then actually GPR starts to grind. And then if you have many iterations and your GPR is grinding, you have computational issues again. So I think it's not a promising thing unless you go to sparse GPs. So, um, or neural networks. <laughs> <laughs> different problem, different hammer. But so, Roland, do we talk later? So let's thank Milica once again and then we introduce